My name is Nick Thorpe. I am a uh, software engineering manager and a lean and agile coach with Intel's manufacturing validation engineering group. I'll tell you a little bit about what MVE does here in a minute. Um, but what I'm uh, going to share with you today is, uh, first of all, how, how we use um, Agile Central to facilitate you know, our, our scaled Agile implementation. We have a very large scaled Agile uh, deployment, about uh, 400 plus scrum teams, about 4,000 people, uh, all planning together, all in the tool. And to make that work at that scale, we had to develop a lot of extensions on top of Agile Central. So I'll talk about what we, what we have done and some of the infrastructure we had to build around that to really make that uh, workable. Uh, hopefully there'll be a few minutes available for questions at the end. Uh, if not, you can just come find me around you know, afterwards. Uh, I don't think I'm scheduled to go anything next, so I'm happy to chat more with you. Uh, all right, so legal wants us to be aware of certain things, so thank you lawyers for your, your contributions. Um, all right, so I don't need to tell you a whole lot about Intel. I'm not here to sell anything. Uh, you, you know you know what Intel does. I, I'm sure you have Intel chips in something, and if, if not you personally, your companies most certainly do. Uh, so thank you for your business. Um, but we, we have um, thousands of different products at any given time, and because of you know, the, the rate of change of the product stack, they, they tend to roll over uh, about a third of them every, every year. So uh, hugely dynamic environment as far as the change in products, the change in uh, requirements and the roadmap. So uh, this is why Agile and why Scaled Agile is so important to us. We have to respond to those, those changes in the product stack very rapidly. So the group I'm in, Manufacturing Validation Engineering, uh, we, we kind of sit in between design, where they design the chips, you know, they, they make the virtual models of the chips, and the factories that are gonna manufacture the chips and the business units that are gonna consume and, and sell them to, to all of you. Um, we also interface with marketing a lot that likes to just kind of come along and rain down interrupts on us. That's, that's kind of what their, what their uh, raison d'etre is. Um, so, you know, because we're kind of scrunched in between these groups, we have a lot of customers and a lot of suppliers we have to manage. But MVE itself is, is a very large organization that fits within this even larger picture. Uh, we are very much a global organization, so we have about um, 40, no, actually with contractors, about 5,000 people scattered at you know, more than a dozen sites around the world, nine different time zones, makes meetings fantastic. Uh, but of course that means we need tools and processes that are going to you know, work at a global scale for that many people at that many geographies. Uh, last thing before I kind of dive into Agile Central, but I think it's important to understand how we use SAFE is the how we are organized. So we have three uh, vertical groups that drive the business segments that we develop products for. So data center makes all the chips for you know, server usage. Uh, the client segment, desktops, laptops, you know, high-end tablets, things like that. And then devices or internet of things, which is the buzzword that you often hear. So these, these groups uh, kind of feed the what. They, they develop our, for, for, uh, our portfolios and feed those to the trains. Then our horizontal groups have all of the people. So this is where 92% of the org is in those horizontal groups. That's where all of our scrums are. That's where all the people are. That's where all the knowledge about how we do uh, product development lives in the organization. So uh, very large deployment in Agile Central. We, Intel as a whole has more than this, but just our organization has 4,500 people all in one workspace in Agile Central. Um, the number changes day to day, but around 450 Scrum teams. So everybody uses Scrum. Some people do use Kanban boards, but we are definitely a, a Scrum shop. Uh, we have 27 scaled Agile release trains, um, each with their own portfolios. They all focus on one of those segments, so there's going to be some trains for the server segment, some trains for clients, some trains for devices, um, and a few trains that are enabler trains. They feed capabilities to the other trains. And then a fairly rapid amount of creation of data or creation of, of the planning work. So around 40,000 user stories written every uh, release cycle or program increment. So that means every year we're growing by 
uh, about a quarter million user stories in the instance. So fairly, fairly rapid creation of information that we somehow have to distill and visualize and, and manage. Um, to make all of this work, we've had to develop about 25 custom apps ranging from you know, simple tools that just make things a little bit faster, shaving some clicks off for our users here and there, to uh, rather massive apps that allow our teams to plan at the scale we're planning. How do we see you know, who is committed to support parts of the portfolio, who is not? How do we measure and monitor release progress? You know, where, where are, the, where are the, the teams struggling? Where are the trains struggling as they go through that release cycle, that program increment? So uh, how we're kind of structured in Agile Central, we have uh, our product trains with their portfolios, their infrastructure teams, test program teams, analog teams, and functional teams. So these are all kind of sections underneath each of the trains. And then if you look at the entire workspace with my, my beautiful train graphic here, um, you know, we have milestones that kind of float up above everything. The milestones here are the milestone entities in, in Rally. And then the portfolios which are owned by the trains. So the train has um, what we call business objectives, which are the top level of our portfolios. Epics, which you know the, the normal term is initiatives or the default term, but you can rename them however you want, so we have. And then features. And of course the features go with the release cycles that the trains plan to. And then, of course, the Scrum teams, you know, they're off writing their stories and, and putting those in the various releases. We do uh, typically 10-week release plan increments, so five of those a year. That means one of them is 12 weeks. It happens over the holidays. Uh, so all 27 of our trains are planning on the same cadence. Every 10 weeks, they are doing release planning, big room planning. We try to bring them all together into a room if we can. Uh, and the physical process of doing the planning, we kind of use the out-of-the-box capabilities. So the portfolio owners are going to write features, uh, the, the teams are going to write stories, connect them to the features, and then they'll start making commits to say, yeah, we can commit to this feature, or no, we can't, we have some resource impediment, or we don't have what we need from design, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're also going to identify risks and dependencies here. So we do, uh, we do try to do risk identification. Uh, we used to do Rome, if you're familiar with Rome from the Scale Algebra Framework. We don't use those terms anymore, but we still have states for the risks as far as are they open, are they materialized, are they, uh, are they closed, you know, did we, did we avoid that risk? And then of course dependency identification, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So, Teams go through and, and do all this kind of planning work, and then they sit down with our chief engineers. These are our portfolio owners. And they discuss what they can commit to and what they can't commit to. So, you know, where, where do they have those, those resource challenges or things they need that they're, they're not getting from their supplier teams or from, you know, peer organizations outside of it, MVE. Uh, we also have reports that check uh, data integrity. So for this whole thing to work, we have to monitor, uh, you know, these 40,000 stories across, you know, a thousand features that the teams are, are writing to see if the data is entered correctly, meaning are the stories sized? Did they use t-shirt sizing? Um, if they put a story in a sprint, you know, did they put acceptance criteria on it? Are the stories scheduled to be completed before the features are scheduled to be completed. So things like that. So we have reports that are going to check for those data integrity issues. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll look at risks, we'll look at, uh, look at the dependencies. And as we start to go through the release cycle, there are various apps and reports that we monitor to see, okay, is the, is the train on the tracks? Is the, is the release cycle progressing as we expect it to? And I'll, I'll share a couple of those with you here in a second. So this is one of the customizations. Hopefully you can kind of see it. I know it's kind of light. Um, this is one of the custom apps that we developed to facilitate release planning for our teams. We call it the team report. And uh, this doesn't replace, you know, kind of the, the, the team planning capabilities in, in Rally. Teams are still using those as far as writing stories, connecting stories to features. I mean, all of that works out of the box. But we wanted a way to show for each feature, um, 
are you as a team able to commit to what that feature is asking or not? You know, we, we need to be able to see that, to say, where are the problems? You know, show me, show me where we're not going to be able to m deliver some feature or some capability to our customers uh, because some teams said, wait, we have a problem meeting the acceptance criteria of this feature. So one of the big things they do in here is to, is to go and look and see, uh, you know, I can't commit to this or I can commit to this. If I can't, here's, here's what I need. And along with that, they are identifying dependencies and risks. So we do use the built-in dependency functionality, the predecessor successor functionality that is in, in Rally. The one problem we have with that is, is that that implementation assumes that your uh, supplier, you know, that the team upstream from you, has already written a story to give you what you're asking for. We found that wasn't usually the case. It's like you go talk to somebody else and say, I need you to do this for me. And they say, OK, well, we'll think about it. But that means they haven't you know, committed to do that story yet. So we had to develop a way to basically put an ask out there, to go to another team and say, hey, we need something from you. Here's what it is. Here's the story that we need it for. But the other team hasn't written a story. They haven't picked a story yet. So there's kind of this mailbox functionality that is all within the tool, but it's, it's sitting you know, kind of hidden in the system where, OK, I can see that you know, this team needs something from me. I'm going to go write a story for that. I'm going to you know, say this is the story that will satisfy that dependency. And then we use the, the native connection as far as predecessors and successors to track that. Um, teams, of course, also you know, want to me measure their uh, kind of telemetry as far as does the plan we're making fit into the five sprints in that 10-week release cycle? Um, you know, are we using our velocity, uh, first of all, responsibly, but have we made a plan that is actually a, a realistic plan or not? Uh, so we kind of show them this as they're building out that release. And um, we, we have also have some metrics there around work that we consider to be, uh, consider to be continuous improvement work. So we ask all of our teams to invest uh, at least 10% and usually closer to 20% of their velocity in continuous improvement. And via several met methods, either they tie it to a feature that is a CI feature, or they indicate on the story this is a CI story, or there's a field that says how many hours of improvement have you saved, like how, many, how much recurring uh, process improvement have you accomplished. So if they fill any of that out, we count it as CI work, and that shows up here to say, OK, you know, here's how much of your velocity you're actually budgeting for continuous improvement work. So um, a, a lot of our teams like that opportunity to be able to invest in, in you know, eliminating waste and improving the process. So all of the teams are using this team report during their release planning uh, events, the big room planning events. And what they're building is this. So this is our version of the program board. This shows us for a train how the teams are, how their plans are coming together. So these are the features down the left side here. Um, this tells us when those features uh, are supposed to be done. We use ISO work weeks. Um, ISO work weeks are fantastic. If you, if you don't use them, you should. It will change your life, but the topic for a different day. Um, and then each of these cells here tells us, has that team committed to the feature, which is green, or they said, no, we cannot commit to this feature. There's, there's something we need, which turns it red, or it's not applicable. There's nothing, nothing for me to do here. So this board will get built over the course of several days as the teams enter information in their team reports. And what emerges is this picture of the features that have problems. So these features have teams that have said, no, we cannot commit to this feature. The chief engineers know those are the ones they need to focus on. The other ones are probably OK. Orange means, well, everybody's committed to it, but nobody wrote stories for it. So how's that going to work? Um, you know. But we want to be able to see these things. We want visual indicators that just bring out where the problems are. Is the plan going to work? You know, yes or no? Again, thousands of users, dozens of trains, hundreds of teams. We really need uh, ways to make decisions quickly. So we need some way of showing, here's the problem. So, and here's the help that's needed. So that's what the reports are trying to bubble up, trying to make more visible uh, as the teams go through release planning and then as they progress through the release. So during the release, this board flips into a tracking mode. And you just toggle a switch, and then it says, 
for each team, for each feature, how are they doing? And we use the same uh, progress coloring indicators that uh, you find on the portfolio items tab. So if you look at a feature and look at its progress bar, it'll be green or yellow or red or, or gray if it's done. So we use the same algorithms here. And this just tells us where, where are we in trouble. Um, in some cases, it may be everywhere. But um, this was probably at the very end of the release where you don't really have a margin for error at that point. As we go through the release, we also need to track uh, overall progress for the train. So one of our most popular apps, uh, we didn't expect it to be very popular, but everybody likes it, is what we call the train performance dashboard. So we have cumulative flows on here. You've probably seen cumulative flows. They are built into the tool. Um, these are custom cumulative flows that have things like trend lines on them. They use, again, those work weeks, because that's how our people think about, you know, in terms of dates. And then we have some metrics here on, is the scope increasing or decreasing? If you're increasing the scope of your release, I mean, you're adding, you're adding a lot of risk there. You may not be able to finish the release. So we want to be able to see that. Are you adding scope during the release? And then are we trending to finish uh, the work? We have accept a commit for the original commit and then for the final, meaning if we added scope, the final accept a commit is going to be lower than the original because of all the extra work we've added in. We've taken out work, then again, it would be better because now our trend is needs to hit a lower target. So this works at the train level, it works at the team level, or it works at like families of teams, teams of teams that are part of the train. Um, and we have some performance against schedule information. The chief engineers want to know, again, which features are in trouble. So you could see stuff like this on the portfolio items tab. You can see feature progress, but they want to know, well, OK, which ones are most behind? Because you know, I might have said I need this feature five weeks into the release in order to hit some, some target. So based on those dates, we know when we started, we know when it's due, we can calculate where we should be today. So not only do we show percent done as of today, but we show where you should be, and we can visualize the gap. We can say, well, you know, we, we are uh, 500 story points behind on this feature. We may need some swarming if this is a really important feature. If this is rank one and we're that far behind, you know, something has to change here. Otherwise, we're going to miss some commit to, to our business units. So these reports aggregate a lot of data. And they take a long time to load. So just within the US, reports like the commit matrix, that train performance dashboard can take 15 to 50 seconds to load. But we have people all over the world. We have people in Israel, people in Malaysia, people in Ireland. So the load times can be as long as five minutes. I've had some people tell me 15 minutes. I'm not sure I believe them, or I don't know what game they were playing when they, you know, when they ran into that problem. But um, it takes a long time, and you know, the, a lot of these people aren't going to be patient enough to wait for that report to load. There's also a huge variation just globally. So. Our teams in the U.S. might be perfectly happy. Our teams in Israel, you know, it's, it's, it's pitchforks. Um, you know, every day they're like, this system is so slow. Do we have to use this tool? And when it gets that bad, they're going to find some way around it. You know, they're not going to waste their time watching a little spinner. They're, they're going to find some other way to do their work, and they're going to do the absolute minimum amount of planning they have to do, which doesn't help us at all as far as seeing what we're trying to accomplish. So one thing we've had to develop as we deployed these reports is this idea of, of caching the data to render the reports. So we have the data coming out of Agile Central. And we use virtual browsers. So we use, we refer to it as Phantom. Um, it's actually kind of a stack of, of Phantom with Spooky, with Casper. Um, JavaScript library writers are very creative with their naming. So, uh, but Phantom is a headless browser. And you give it a web page. It loads it virtually in memory. And then we extract from that you know, the process data that we got from the APIs of, of Rally. So from the Web Services API, from the Lookback API. We pulled a lot of data. And now we can save that data and reuse it. So what we do is every hour for every train, we have 
you know, robots that are loading the apps, saving the data, and then when our regular users come in, they hit the cache and the page loads within three or four seconds, and they're like, oh, cool. I saw what I needed to see, and I can get in and get out quickly. Um, it's not just the robots, so anybody can be a robot in this case. Any user that loads the page, if there wasn't a cache, will save their data to our caching server. So for some reason, you know, we, we lost a cache or we missed it or somebody poked the reload button to you know, refresh the cache and they were willing to pay that 60 second penalty to load the data, we'll just save that back to the cache and, and keep it updated. Uh, all the data goes into Couchbase, uh, and we use TTLs or Time to Lives to make sure that we're not showing really old data. So if we haven't refreshed it within an hour, it's going to expire. When you go to that page, you're going you're gonna to pay the, you know, the, the 50, 60 second penalty to load all the data again. So because we have these caches, this starts to let us do really interesting things with aggregation. Remember I said we have 27 trains. We have executives. Executives love executive dashboards. So we need to show them all of the trains. How are all of the trains doing? And to load all of this data, real time would take at best five minutes. In reality, it would probably never load. I mean, one or more of those queries is gonna fail and we're gonna have to retry it. You know, you, if you fire off you know, 120 look back API queries, you're, you're really uh, asking for trouble there. So the caching, uh, remember, it's processing the data. So we can also save the aggregations for each individual train load. Those go into Couchbase as well. And then when you go to this show me everything dashboard, it goes and grabs up the aggregation for all of the trains. And then again, within a few seconds, it says, OK, here's how all of the trains are doing. Remember, Phantom uh, is, a, is a virtual browser, which means we can screenshot what is uh, being loaded in that virtual browser. So we can actually replay releases. We can go back in time and we can see what did the report look like on this day at this time. Similar to look back, I mean, you could kind of do the same thing with, with look back API, again, if you wanted to go and run that query for that time period. Um, but we're processing the data to do things like trend lines. So how are we trending? three weeks ago versus today. So we capture all of that and we can kind of, uh, one, we can go back to any point in time, but two, we could also just take all of these images and play them together as a video so you kind of have a little, uh, you know, 15 second way of visualizing the progress of a train and you can start to do kind of this mental analysis of how people plan um, to see with your own eyes. Oh, I see how this release plan is evolving. It seems like, you know, they always, they always run into trouble around the middle of the release and things like that. Webhooks. Anyone here use webhooks or familiar with them? A couple people. Uh, so webhooks are good. They're, they're your friends. You should use them. We, um, we use them for a couple different purposes. First of all, in order for the apps to work, everything has to be in the release, the release time box. So if it's not in the release, it's not part of the train's you know, release cycle. It's not part of that PI. And so our teams get a little annoyed when we say, you gotta put your story in the sprint, and you gotta put your story in the release, and they're like, well, yeah, but I mean, the sprint is part of the release, so why don't you just put it in the release? And we said, we can do that. So the webhooks are sucking up all of the changes, and if a story goes into a sprint, our sprints have standard naming that tells us what release they're part of, and then we assign it to the correct release for the teams. So we don't have to do data integrity checks for that. You know, we don't have to show on the report, hey, you forgot to set the release time box. We know what it should be. We set it for them and eliminate that, that data integrity check. We just fix the data integrity issues. Um, dependency connections. Remember I mentioned we have kind of a funny way of managing dependencies where a team could put an ask out there. And if they haven't gotten what they asked for yet, it's just going to kind of sit out there. And if people start deleting stories, the connections get broken. So the webhooks are looking for that and they're trying to fix those connections so that our, uh, our, our kind of hacky way of doing dependencies stays correct in the system. And then burn downs. So there's a, there's a deep assumption in, in Rally that uh, you will size tasks. 
If you want to burn down, you have to size tasks, because that's where you get the blue bars in the burn down charts. If you don't size tasks, no blue bars for you. Um, we, didn't, we didn't like that. We don't want our team sizing tasks, because we don't have a time tracking mentality. I mean, we're not a billable hours org, so there isn't really value to us in asking our teams to size the tasks. We say size the stories with t-shirt sizes, and then go. You know, planning is meant to be quick and simple. So when we stopped asking teams to size tasks, they stopped getting burn downs. So one thing the webhooks are doing is when a story is sized, when a story is put in a sprint or put in a release, we go and automatically set the task sizes just to be an equal weight of the story size. So if I have a four point story with four tasks, each task is sized as a one. If I add a fifth task, the webhook will swoop in and size them all 0.8 just so we can have meaningful burn downs and we don't have to ask our teams to, to size task because that leads us down a dark path of tracking time, not tracking the value added as they deliver the stories. So doing webhooks um, in an enterprise environment is kind of tricky, largely due to firewalls. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, my, my mortal enemies are IT. Any, anytime I ask them to do something for me, they say no, or, you know, they, they make me fill out a lot of uh, documentation justification. So, uh, if, you, if you can't work with IT, you work around IT, which is basically what we've done. So, webhooks come out of Agile Central, and they go to AWS. AWS feeds our queues. We use, we use, well, we use a mixture of SQS and AWS for the external queue, and then that feeds to our internal Kafka queues. Um, goes through your, your data center using your, you know, your, your favorite processors, and then with whatever business logic we, we need to do to that webhook, if we need to make changes, we send those changes back using the REST APIs to Agile Central. Um, so it works really well. You can get you know, real-time event handling. There's no such thing as an event handler in Rally. You can't like, put code in that says, stop somebody from setting this field to this value. But the webhooks get you about as close as you're going to get without a platform change, which is just saying, when you see this, if you need to take some action with it, whether it's correct a value, send somebody an email saying go correct a value, or you know, worst case, delete something that's bad, um, we can do that with the webhooks. Of course, we need to, to monitor this whole system. We need to make sure it's, it's, it's running and it's healthy. So we do have some, some metrics around that. All, all the stuff that we're running gets fed into Elastic. And then, of course, if you have Elastic, you can have Kibana dashboards. And this tells us, basically, is the system working? Again, those visual indicators. Is it normal or is it abnormal? The red or green cells. This is our, our visual indicator for, for DevOps. And you know, I, I personally really like these, these pie charts because I can just look at that and quickly say, is the system working as I expect or not? If this one is not a peace symbol, and this one is not a plus sign, something is wrong. I don't know what, but somewhere in the matrix something is wrong, so then we go off and we can, we can troubleshoot that. But it's really important to have just quick visual indicators that tell you, I don't know what the problem is yet, but something is, something is not right in your system. Um, so you, you, you know that you need to go take action. Another thing that we, we found we had to do at the scale that we're at is try to figure out where the people are in our system. So remember I said we have 450 scrum teams, 27 trains. That's a lot of people and a lot of teams. And we're putting a lot of faith in the managers to like actually get people into those scrum teams correctly. Uh, if, you, if you ask the managers to go and do this, only a certain percentage are going to actually going to. Um, but we have rules around the composition of our scrum teams and the composition of our trains. So a scrum team should be three to nine developers. It's kind of an industry best practice. One product owner, one scrum master. They should all be committed, so dedicated to that one scrum team, not moonlighting on other teams. Co-located, sitting at the same site, and be cross-functional for their purpose. Same for the trains, max of 150 people on the train, committed, basically one scrum team should only work on one train at a time. You don't want to have scrum teams working across two different trains. Co-location, for us that means a geo, so you're all in the Americas, or you're all in Europe, or you're all in Asia. It just makes your 
the ability to have meetings like at all possible. If not, you're going to be having 6 a.m. phone calls or 10 p.m. phone calls. It's kind of destroyed my life. But, um, and the train can execute its entire value stream from end to end. So if you're familiar with SAFE, you're familiar with Laughing Wells finding the kidney exercise. Finding the kidney means I have all of the pieces of that value stream represented on the train. So how do we visualize this? How do we, how do we again find what's normal and what's abnormal in the system, where the problems are? For us, we have a train capability and capacity dashboard. So drawing on the Scrum team membership information, we know which teams are meeting the size, five to nine developers, one product owner, one Scrum master. They're sitting together at the same site. Again, from our employee, you know, HR systems, we know what site people are at. So we can say, are, is everybody you have said is on the Scrum team sitting at the same site or not? And uh, we can see if they're committed. Are people on one and only one Scrum or are they on multiple Scrums? So that shows up here and it just tells us, uh, you know, where the problems are as far as Scrum team resourcing and then train resourcing. Are there trains that are too big, not committed, not co-located, things like that? As well as cross-functional. So if we expect to have a function like, you know, yield capabilities, um, if they're missing from the train, we can flag it and say, hey, this train doesn't have this function that it's supposed to. So that's a problem because they're going to have to get it from somewhere. So now they have a dependency on their release for some other team to come in and help them. And if that team doesn't have time, then they're in trouble. Okay. Um, so when we bring all this together, we have teams writing stories, sizing them. That gives us information about effort, like where the resources are being spent, the, the human resources. We have the portfolios, and we tie those to milestones. Our milestones come from our corporate system of record. I mean, there's you know a database that says, for this CPU product, you know we will start selling it to customers on this date at this time. And so we just pull those milestones in as milestone items in, in Rally. But so we have this, this linkage that shows us, for each of those products, how much velocity is going to them. And from our trained membership information, we know where the people are. We know, you know, we have 150 people on this train. We know what this train works on from a velocity or a budget perspective. So now we generate um, headcount actuals that we give to finance without having to go around and ask people, what did you work on this month? What did you work on this month? So full automation as far as uh, that, that uh, accounting, as far as you know, how much headcount is being spent on each product, we figure that out just based on where the velocity goes, where the people are, and that goes to finance, and it just gets uploaded to whatever database they need to do their you know, accounting-y stuff, their, their roll-ups every month. We also use this to feed headcount budgets in release planning. So of course, somewhere out there, there's like a database that says, you know, you will spend exactly 38.5 heads on a product. We're not going to do that, but we can translate that into, you know, a velocity budget for the train. So we can say, because you were budgeted for this many heads, that means you should see, you know, 32% of your train's velocity going to this. And if you're significantly above or below that, somebody's going to come around and ask you, hey, you know, we gave you heads. Why aren't they working on this product? So that's where we are at today. Where are we going next? So again, um, executive level, they want information quickly. They want to know where the problems are. And this goes beyond MVE. This goes up to you know, the, the SVPs and the executive VPs and stuff. It's like, how are you guys doing with this product? You know, we're, we're spending a lot of money on your org. So you know, are, you, are you on track? Do you need help? So program level roll-ups across all of the trains. We need to get that information out across all trains, across milestones, and just feed it up quickly. Uh, one thing we're doing here is basically timelines. If you've ever used the portfolio timeline that's part of Rally, you probably know that it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's hard to compete with sliced bread, but the portfolio timeline doesn't quite cut it. So we basically rolled our own. Um, this is an off-the-shelf uh, JavaScript library. We didn't, I think it's called TimelineJS. I mean, not, nothing special about it. But again, you wire it up to the APIs, and you, you can 
build your own timeline however you want. So for us, you know, we have the portfolio structured how we want to see them. We have the progress indicators. We have the milestones coming from our, our systems, um, systems of record. So uh, we get those kind of executive level roll-ups. They can see the information they want to see at whatever level. If you want to drill in, you can. If you want to go to the top, you can. Uh, the next step we're working on is visualizing dependency connections. So, you know, if, if you have done SAFE, if you've done a SAFE program board, you probably remember the red string. Red string is dependencies between two teams. Team A needs something from Team B, and I need to see that because if a dependency is moving, then there's going to be a problem. Things are going to pile up on the board. So now that we have the dependencies, we have timelines, we can start visualizing that and saying, you know, there's a dependency between two teams for this feature or between two trains even. Train A depends on train B in order to complete a feature. We can start to visualize that. So um, nothing we're developing is, is IP to us. You know, we make processors. We don't make rally apps. So I'm happy to, you know, share with you what we're doing to discuss, uh, you know, how we did it, show you the code again, not, none, of it, none of it's secret. Um, so feel free to reach out and connect. Um, there's a lot of Nick Thorpe's out there, but there's only one at Intel that, that I know of. Um, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to learn more about how you are using you know, Agile Central as you have scaled and what challenges you've had to overcome you know, to make the tool work at, as you started to add hundreds or thousands of users you know, to one implementation.